Hi, I'm Daniel Chan from UNSW Sydney. Welcome to another adventure in pure mathematics. Grotendieck equated for us the study of affine algebraic geometry and commuted algebra. So that means uh, some algebraic notions such as modules over commuted ring should have some sort of geometric interpretation. And in fact, that is indeed the case. And what I want to show you in this video is how, in fact, modules are examples of sheaves. Okay, so I want to begin by a little uh, example which hopefully will give you a flavor of how this is true and uh, we'll work in a very simple sense where we look at some sort of affine line over an algebraically closed field K and this affine line remember we can associate algebraically to that its coordinate ring which in this case is just a polynomial ring K of X with one variable X so this is going to be the variable on the affine line of course, if you start with this data of this commuted ring, you can talk more generally about schemes, and in that sort of uh, setting, we use the notation spec R, and I'll use it here. But if you like, you can just think of this as the variety. It's just an affine line, just a copy of K. Okay, so that's the ring that we have, and we also want to have a module. Okay, so the module here is simple enough. It's just going to be a quotient of K of X, okay, and uh, we're going to quotient out by the ideal generated by X. So as a vector space, of course, when you look at this, it's just K. But if you write it as k, you don't know what the uh, action of k of x is, okay? So this is basically, um, k of x, how does it act? Well, um, it's a uh, k linear action, and x acts as 0 here, okay? So I want to say it's a shift. So if, uh, to be a shift, that means that we have to know what its values are on open subsets, okay? So remember, how do we go to open subsets? okay inside algebraic geometry so we use localization which algebraically corresponds to inverting elements okay so let's look at some open subsets so the first one uh, which is going to be important for us is we'll look at the open subset of a1x where x is non-zero okay so away from this point here okay so what is the coordinate ring of this open subset? So remember that it's obtained by inverting um, x because you're looking at the principal open subset where x is non-zero. So we invert x, okay? The inverse as x is now a well-defined rational function um, uh, on the whole of this set u because we removed x equals zero. And of course, we can also write this as the uh, ring of Laurent polynomials. Okay, so it's natural to think of, well, what is m on this open set? Well, we can also localize this m um, by inverting x. And let's just see what we get here, okay? So here, how should we think about this? In this case, it's fairly easy because x on this m will act as zero, but x is also invertible, so it has to act as an invertible element. So if uh, you're acting invertibly and also as zero, that means that the whole module actually has to equal zero. Okay, so if we look here, um, you'll find that this is actually zero. Okay, so let's have a look and see what happens if you sort of uh, apply this idea to other open sets, okay? So suppose instead U contains an open neighborhood of this um, X, okay? So uh, let's suppose it's a principal open uh, subset, and in fact um, they will all be, unless uh, you look at the whole... Um, no, they will actually all be of that form. Um, so suppose it's given by F is non-zero. Then let's look, have a look at the localization of M when you invert F. Okay, and let's see what happens here. So in this case, what happens? Okay, so f is non-zero at zero. So um, how does f act on this m? Well, the way it acts is since x is equal to zero, it's just looking at multiplying on here by f of zero. Okay, because x is going to be e e equal to zero. So it's just multiplying by f of zero, which uh, since uh, this uh, u defined by f non-zero contains zero, that means that f of zero is non-zero. Okay. So this uh, number is inside k, this field, which is, also, uh, is non-zero, so it's already invertible. So adding this f inverse in the denominator, this, uh, which is just basically, in this case here, f0 inverse, uh, doesn't give you anything new. And um, uh, that suggests to you, and it's quite easy to prove, that in fact, m of f inverse is just the original module, okay, at least as a module over here, but also as a module, um, you can think of it naturally as a module over um, r, F inverse. Okay, so it's a copy of K. Okay, so um, that's what happens for all these sorts of open sets. Um, if you look at any open set that's cont in, that contains zero, then you'll get K. If it doesn't contain zero, if it, like this one here, it turns out it will always be zero. So you can also um, soup up this argument to show that for any subset 
of this U, which is open. Uh, if you look at the localization there, you're just going to localize further. So you're localizing zero will just give you zero. Okay. So um, how do we want to visualize geometrically what's happening here? Okay, so the way we think of this is that the module it will be something that we think of as sitting on on this affine line, and away from x equals zero is just zero. But right at this little point here, it's going to be a copy of k. We just imagine a little copy of k sitting above here, like that. So you have an open set that contains this zero. The sections over that open set will be this k. But if it doesn't contain it, it'll be zero, okay? And so this is an example of what's called a skyscraper sheet in algebraic geometry, okay? And that's very, very important sort of an object uh, that you'll see there. And I think it's the one that easily illustrates the geometric um, understanding of this module, okay? So you can really see it for uh, what it is geometrically and visualize it. Okay, so I hope that gives you a little bit of feel for what we want to try to do here. Okay, uh, now let's proceed to the general setup. Okay, so the general setup R will be a commutative ring. Okay, and uh, just a reminder, okay, we can talk about spec R. Um, uh, and in this case here, this has a topology. Okay, it's a set consisting, or if you want to think of it in the scheme theoretic sense, um, uh, it'll be all the prime ideals. Um, but if you're just willing to look at the case where your R is some sort of finitely generated, um, uh, finitely generated K algebra, okay, which is a domain, and then you can think of it as just the corresponding variety, and then you have a uh, Zariski topology for that as well. So um, you can work in both settings, okay. And um, the point is that this topology has a basis consisting of um, principal principal open subsets. Okay, so just to remind you, principal open subsets is just a, one of the form that's given by um, a principal ideal, so basically just an element. Uh, we pick uh, some element inside R, okay, for any element inside R, you can generate this principal open subset DF, which is the uh, open set where F is non-zero. Okay. Now, uh, the scholium here is that, remember, the sheaf property means what? Okay, so the main thing about the sheaf property is that it's trying to com capture the local global relationship. So in particular, if, if you find things on all enough open sets, okay, so on an open cover, you can recover what it is on the union of that open cover. Okay, so since uh, this is the basis for the topology, that means that every open set is a union of these principal open sets. So that means that the sheaf property implies that if you're looking on this spec R, okay, the types of topological spaces arising in algebraic geometry, um, to give a sheaf on that, um, you just have to say, not the sections on any open set, you just need to say what they are on the principal open sets here. Okay, Those principal open subsets will, will allow you to do that. Okay, So that's a very, very important point. And in many ways, uh, when you think in algebraic geometry, um, these are the ones uh, which allow you to think about what's going on. Okay, These are, in some sense, the most important ones. Okay. Uh, you don't really need to think about all the open sets. Okay, so, uh, okay, so let's uh, go back to our module now. We haven't introduced a module in our general setup, so we'll pick a module. Uh, so this is the standard notation for the category of R modules, and this just means that M is some R module. And I want to say now that there's an associated sheaf. And usually what we do to talk about the associated sheaf is we change this Roman style writing to this calligraphic style, uh, the script uh, M here. So there's this sheaf on spec R. And by this scholium here, to kind of define it, really, the main thing is I just need to define it on principal open subsets. So what is the, um, uh, remember we have to assign to any principal open subset this uh, set, okay, uh, script MDF. And um, so what's going to, be, uh, what, what's that going to be? By the way, the name for this is the, it's the sections of M over DF, okay. So what we do is we take our module M and we just localize by inverting F. That's what it's going to be, okay? And um, I guess we also have to talk about what the restrictions maps are. That's part of the data. I'll talk about that um, below here. Um, but before we go and do that, uh, I guess the most important thing is to have a look and see what happens when, the, in the very special case, when this DF, that open set, is the whole of the space, spec R, okay? So how do you get that? Um, the easiest way to say, what is spec R? It, well, it's the locus where one is not zero, but one is 
not zero everywhere. So this is just inverting one, and of course inverting one doesn't do anything. So this just gives you M. Okay, so the sections of the script M, this associated sheaf over the whole uh, the variety or spectrum, okay, this whole affine variety or affine scheme, okay, is going to be the original module M. Okay, so uh, let's just see uh, why this is true. Um, I don't want to give you a full proof. It's actually a bit nasty, but the main idea is, okay, and to get a feel for what's going on, um, uh, I'm going to show you, okay, and, and that's going to be achieved by just looking and seeing what happens on principal open sets, okay? So that's the key, okay? So once you've done it for principal open sets, you can actually sweep this up just using some um, machinery on colons, uh, limits and things like that um, to see what happens for general uh, uh, open sets. And uh, that's because of the sheaf property and the fact that, of course, every uh, open set is a union of principal open sets. So I guess the first thing to do is to see well, what happens when you um, restrict from one open set DF to another open set, okay? Now, of course, if uh, uh, this is a little bit of trick that I'm using here, okay? So if this open set is a subset of this one, well, not only is uh, uh, to be a subset, that means that F is non-zero. So you can also say that, that it is of the form FG doesn't equal zero, okay? So that's something that you can do because, it, well, it's certainly of the form that G doesn't equal zero. And if you know that G doesn't equal zero implies F doesn't equal zero, you can also throw in this F as well, okay? That's not going to do any harm. Okay, so what's the prescription say here? Well, here it says that well, uh, on this M, you invert F. And here it says that uh, you invert FG. And if you invert FG, since F and G are inside the ring, you're inverting both F and G. So you can write this as, and you can show this uh, using uh, algebra, that you can perform this localization, this single localization, in two steps. First, you localize by inverting F, and then you localize that by inverting G. So here you have a module. And essentially, you have the module same over here, except for you localize this G as well. And of course, you've got a map from here to here. You just send elements here to that same element here over 1. So the power of G that you have in the denominator here is over 1. Okay, and uh, I mean, I guess uh, you should see that there's a very natural map that goes from here and here anyway. Okay, so basically, if you write this as a fraction M over some power of F, you have the same fraction over here as well, except for um, you don't need to put any Gs. Okay? It's essentially the same fraction. Okay? So that's the restriction map. And it's quite easy to show that uh, these are functorial. Okay? If you have a third one, okay, then it doesn't matter whether you do this process in two steps or you go um, uh, to the process in a single step okay, all the way. Okay? So the key thing and the most interesting thing is to see why does this sheaf property hold? And that's the next thing that I want to show you. Establishing the sheaf property for this script M is extremely interesting. And it uses some ideas that are kind of borrowed from uh, manifold theory. Uh, what we'll do is we'll just consider the very simplest case, uh, which gives you this uh, flavor of the general proof. Uh, as I said, firstly, we can restrict ourselves to principal uh, open sets. And let's suppose that we just look at the case where X is going to be written as the union of two open sets. Okay, so uh, I guess you should do this uh, more generally when you have an open cover of any open set. Uh, it will turn out that this is going to be fairly general because uh, any principal open set, if you replace uh, any, uh, this X with any principal open set, that's also going to be affine. Okay, so let's suppose we're in this situation here. Okay, uh, and then uh, let's have a little think about what this means and try to interpret algebraically what we have. Okay, so uh, X is a union of these two sets, so that means the complements have empty intersection. So the locus where both F and G are zero is going to be empty. And this you can cast it in a very algebraic way quite simply. Okay, so how do you look at the locus where both of these are empty? So you can look at the ideal generated by this. And that ideal has to be the whole of the ring. So this is actually equivalent just to, uh, if you look at the ideal generated by F and G, this is all of R. Okay? And the key point is that this gives you what's called the partition of unity. And this is a very important uh, idea and concept in, um, in manifold theory. In manifold theory, you write uh, your manifold as a union of Euclidean um, open sets, okay, so they're uh, 
homeomorphic to uh, like an open disk inside a Euclidean space. Okay. And the idea is that you can rewrite one as a union of, uh, as a sum rather, of functions which are supported in each of those open sets. Okay. So um, it's a lot easier to see what happens in this case here. Okay, once you have this, uh, uh, because what this means is that the, uh, the function one here, you can write as a, so to speak, an R linear combination of F and G. So one equals AF plus BG for some A and B inside R. Actually, we're going to use a, a, a more souped up version of this. Okay, so the same is true if uh, this is empty, then f to the n and g to the n is also empty. So you can have a similar thing here. But I guess you can also just raise this to the power of whatever you like. Uh, so for any big n, okay, here, big n here, I can raise it to the power one to the power of two n. And then if I raise this to the power of two n, what will happen? Well, you get um, lots of powers of f times powers of g and the sums of those powers will add up to 2n so either the power of f is at least n or the power of g is at least n and so when you combine all the terms you'll get something inside r times f to the n plus something inside r times g to the n okay you can certainly write this one in this form here okay so that's the partition of unity and we're going to use this um, in a moment uh, let's just remind ourselves what's the sheaf property that we need to check here. So basically we're saying that um, all the sections over this X, okay, they can be uniquely built out of a section from uh, this open set and this open set as long as they agree. Okay, so suppose we have a section over this DF. So by what I, uh, how I describe the script M, that means that you have an element of MF inverse. So let's call it M1, F1 uh, to the N1 in the denominator. And let's suppose we have a section over this dg, okay, so that's an element of mg inverse. So let's suppose that's the fraction m2 um, over g to the n2. And uh, we're going to assume that they agree on the intersection. So the intersection is uh, where you invert both f and g, so you're looking at the localized module mf inverse g inverse, and you have equality of these two fractions. And in this case, what we have to do is we have to generate an element of this module. Okay, so what's the, remember, one of the sections over all of X, that's just the original module M. Okay, so in fact, you have to show there's a unique element inside there, such that if we look inside this localized module MF inverse, this M is equal to M1 on F1 to the N1. Okay, so that means uh, when you restrict that M to this DF, you get this one here. Okay, and similarly on the DG. Okay, so if you look at m and we think of it inside the localized module mg inverse it equals m2 on g to the n2 okay so um i mean i guess in some ways it's not obvious how to prove this okay so the main uh, tricky thing is well how do you generate this m okay probably you're thinking well to show it's unique maybe that's not too bad but you have to come up with this m okay somehow you have to use all this data and you have to sort of generate this M and that's the main thing that I want to show you and show you how the partition of unity is going to do that okay and to do that I need a little bit of a reduction so the first thing is that I can assume that this big N that I gave here this is any N so this is big enough so it's bigger than both this little N1 and this little N2 so I can assume that N little N1 equals little N2 equals N okay so I can take this big N to the big be the bigger of these two uh, powers of the denominators okay and remember, what I can do to this fraction without changing it is I can multiply top and bottom by powers of f to make this as big as I like. Okay, and the same here. So I can make them both big enough so that they're the same. Okay, well, one of the powers is big enough so it equals the other power. Okay, and that I can call n. Okay, so I can assume this n1 equals n2 equals big n. Okay. So rather than actually checking this for you, okay, it takes a little bit of work, but the key idea is also uh, presented in, um, well, how would you think about trying to prove this? You want to construct this little m, okay, that's the main thing. And the way we'll do it is quite wonderful, and it really borrows this idea from, of partitions of unity from manifold theory, okay? So this m we're going to write as 1 times m, but the way we're going to write out the 1 now is we're going to use this uh, identity here. It's a sub n times f to the big N, uh, plus b sub n times g to the big n. Okay, so we can write, write that here. And now what did we want this little m to be? Okay, well we restrict it 
to this dF. It has to be m1 and f1 to the n1. So let's break this up. We've got this a n f to the n here. And we change this m to m1, um, f to the n1 now, remember, is this big n. Okay. And similarly, uh, for the other one, this m, when we write it and we multiply it with this second part here, we write it the other way as m t on g to the n. And the point is, of course, what you want to do here is uh, you're just going to cancel this f to the n here, and this f to the n here, and this g to the n here with this g to the n here. And then uh, what you get left is this is just equal to a n m1 plus b n m2. Okay? And in fact, this is the value of m, which is going to be the unique element of the module, which satisfies the, all these properties. Okay? And if you want to actually check that that's the case, okay, you will need to use this condition here that I haven't used so far. Okay, but I've used the other one, okay, what we want out of it. Okay. And this uh, is the key ID which shows you that uh, this script M, which I described for you, is actually a sheaf. So just uh, some extra words about how the general sort of proof goes. So firstly, you might think, well, what happens if you have, uh, you've written a, an open set? So firstly, any, uh, uh, as I said before, the key case is when you're looking at principal open sets. And if you have a principal open set, that's still affine, so we can apply uh, this argument to any principal open set as well. And what happens if we write that principal open set as a union of more than two of these things? Well, if there's more of two of th than two of these, uh, we still have this partition of unity, okay? Um, uh, what happens is that you'll just have more than two um, summons here, okay? You'll just have more, but you can certainly extend this. And then maybe when you take the power, you need to take a slightly higher power to make this work. But otherwise, this proof that goes through and shows you this wonderful fact, which allows us to view uh, modules of a commuted ring as this rather geometric thing as a sheaf. And that gives us a picture of it in our minds. I hope you enjoyed this adventure in pure mathematics.